So this is Josh Mandel with a quick demo of some of the work that I've been doing exploring my own electronic health information export. So this is a data format that each electronic health record vendor gets to decide for themselves in order to comply with uh, US certification rules for EHR systems. And it needs to be a complete export. So my local healthcare provider uses an Epic system. And what I've got here in the browser is a set of about 400 tables that Epic uh, supplies as part of the export that I asked my provider to do for me. Um, and working through all these tables can be a little bit overwhelming. There's a lot of data here, including core clinical stuff, but also the detailed financial transactions, all the back and forth with insurance companies, prior authorization, information about how long you spent waiting uh, in the waiting room and what user checked you into the clinical system, the last time your medication history was reviewed, and on and on and on. Uh, so there's a lot of information here, but in order to focus today, uh, I want to just zoom in on one narrow question, uh, which is just taking a look at the problems on my problem list and how they're related to the medications on my medication list. And for this, I'm going to look at a table called order underscore med. Uh, and I've got links next to each of these table names to the documentation that Epic provides on the open.epic website, which is really good for understanding what the tables are kind of all about, and then what columns are in these tables and uh, what kind of values those columns will take. Uh, one thing that's missing from this documentation is really information about how tables are linked to each other. So for example, in my viewer here, I want to be able to understand that the PAT underscore ID column is information about a patient. So that clicking on it will take me to a row in my patients table. Um, but that kind of information is not uh, written down in a clear way. Uh, or similarly, the fact that this order medications table um, is linked to a list of diagnoses here in a child table called uh, order DX med. So those parent child relationships and the foreign key relationships, those kinds of details are, are sort of missing. But I've used some heuristics and sort of reverse engineered the schema as well as I could to get to a point that is at least useful, even if it's not entirely correct. And so I can see uh, these are the medication orders that exist in my data set. And then, for example, this first order is associated with uh, a diagnosis in this table. And then if you want to understand what diagnosis 108212 actually means, you can follow that link to the Clarity Edge table, which is essentially one of the data dictionary tables in the export. And then we can see this as a medication that's been prescribed for primary hypertension. So navigating these kinds of links between the data is a very typical task in health IT. And it's all about being able to understand the schema and the constraints and the cardinalities. And then once you do that, you can navigate the content. Um, but you can imagine with you know, 400 tables in my export or 4,000 tables in the general case of the, the full EPIC EHI uh, schema, that can be really challenging to do. So I've been exploring the use of large language models in making these kinds of data explorations a little bit easier. Um, so I can sort of pull out the sidebar from this demo uh, where I have a prompt for a language model. Um, first thing I should say is I'm always providing a system prompt to the language model that has the TypeScript interfaces, basically uh, schema definitions for the content that I have open in the browser. So right now it's those three tables we looked at, order med, order DX med, and that data dictionary table, clarity edge. So the model will always know the information about what those tables are and what their columns mean. And then furthermore, I've got some basic prompts built in here to encourage the model to write JavaScript code to explore the data in these tables. And I tell it the, the model that it'll have access to an object called DB, which essentially has an array for every single table that's available. So db.clarityedge, db.orderdxmed, and db.ordermed in this case. And I tell the model that it'll be able to access the TypeScript objects in that way. And then I give it access to a kind of utility function called lodash, which makes it e really easy to do things like grouping and sorting data. And I give it access to console.log, which is essentially a JavaScript um, logging functionality. I tell the model, those are the only three functions it's going to be able to call, but it can write code, and I will give it the results of the code and any errors that might happen. And then I give the model some general instructions that are a little bit sort of chain of thought-like, but it's a reminder to formulate a plan first, think carefully about how to traverse the graph of data that we're looking at, um, avoid writing queries that are too brittle, uh, focus on human readability, um, and keep the user's question in mind uh, throughout the process of the analysis. So that's all what you might call kind of meta prompt information. And then right at the bottom, I'm going to write my actual question, which in this case is uh, what problems do I have and what medications do I take for them?
Yeah. And I've got the ability to run a few different uh, large language models here. I'm going to start with one called Claude Sonnet, which is um, a pretty fast and also very capable model. Uh, so we'll see how Sonnet does with this. Uh, this is a task that Sonnet can do correctly most of the time, but sampling from these models always involves a little bit of luck of the draw. So this is part of the fun of a live demo. Uh, so Sonnet has come up with a plan where it's going to do these three steps. But uh, it carefully wrote this plan in a JavaScript code block, but didn't actually write any code. Um, that's OK. I have augmented this UI with a little dynamic button over here that is basically an automated interpretation of the response that the model has given. It looks for a code block, and it'll run that code block if it finds one. And then it'll make it really easy for me to tell the model what the output was. So in this case, there was no output. Uh, I'll just let it know. Uh, so in this case, I've sent it a message saying I've tried to run your code, but I didn't see any output or any errors. And so it's just a built-in reminder. Um, you can get the idea here that as a human, I wouldn't normally be going through this process, clicking this button and sending messages over and over again. You can automate this with a very simple loop. And so I'm trying to have as little role as possible when I do this demo so that you can get the idea that this entire thing could be automated. Um, so at this point, Sonnet has the idea that maybe it should now start writing some code. Um, so it's done that, um, it's querying the database for all the medication uh, orders, and it's going to print some information about them. Uh, I see that this code is going to print 16 long lines and an error. So let me just go ahead and send it on through. Um, and we'll see how the model does with this error, which is a property access error. The model tried to access a property called med description, um, but that doesn't exist. So is the model able to recover? Let's see. Uh, it printed out some new code. Uh, it said, based on the error, I made some updates. Um, and let's just see. Here, I now see zero errors and 16 log lines. So let's see what we got out. Um, in this case, just looking at this kind of sanity check, I see one medication for hypertension and another medication for post-concussion syndrome. Um, and that is exactly right. Uh, now Sonnet was able to read its own outputs and then formulate a very nice simple list showing me the problems, the diagnoses, and making the connection between the two. So that's an example of how a large language model can pretty deftly um, synthesize information and navigate these kinds of dynamic links. Uh, I do want to highlight the point that you know these different models have very different capabilities, uh, different reasoning abilities, and they run at different speeds. So you know, for example, if I went back and uh, tried again with the same initial prompt, but instead of using Claude Sonnet, I might use a smaller, faster model called Haiku. Um, there's a little branching conversation tree here. We'll see if my uh, UI for this works. Uh, I need to press the Again button to uh, query the model again for a new response. Um, and in this case, I'm getting a Haiku answer here. So my text box is labeled with Haiku, and you can see my conversation has forked. I went back to the root, and I started a new query uh, to talk to a different language model. And in this case, let's see how it did. It printed out a whole lot of information. Uh, what did it really want to do? It just tried to print out all the diagnoses and all the meds. Um, but it was able to solve the problem pretty well by printing out a whole bunch of information. Uh, these models have a pretty big context. And so again, I was able to get a pretty nice summary here in just one conversation turn. It didn't do a lot of sophisticated joining or navigating of parent-child relationships, but I would say it did solve the problem, uh, which is kind of cool. And let's just try one more time. Uh, and this time we'll try with the Claude Opus model, which is the sort of largest and most capable model in the set, uh, just to get an idea of how that model is going to perform with this same kind of query. Um, this is a model that is going to work a bit more slowly, uh, but it's still producing code pretty fast here. Uh, in this case, it has 12 log lines and an error. So it didn't get a perfect solution right out of the gate uh, because, again, it's trying to access this description property. This actually makes me want to debug and see whether my schema that I'm supplying to the model might somehow uh, have a flaw in it. So let me just click the TypeScript button here to copy the schema onto my clipboard, and then we'll just take a look. So I see there is, in fact, something called medication order description here that is a string. And it should, according to our schema, be a property on the order med interface. Um, and yet, when the models are trying to access that property uh, description, uh, it's trying to access it on the medication object here, which is 
what we get when we take a db.order med. For each one, we're following to the medications property. And then it's trying to access the description on the medication instead of on the order med. Um, so that's the issue here. It's following this medication link to access something in the clarity medication table. And on that, it's trying to access the description property. Um, so it's reasonable to understand why the model could get confused in following those kinds of properties. But good to see that it's able to take feedback from automatically generated errors and use that feedback to correct the program uh, and then correctly be able to synthesize or summarize the results. Um, so this gives you a sense of the different capabilities of these different models. Um, in this case, I just used the, the three kind of models from um, Anthropic that are currently available under the Claude 3 moniker. Um, but you can also try smaller models. Um, you can try open AI models and so on. Uh, I've been playing a bit with Mixstral uh, with the 22 billion parameter model. Uh, and this one, I would say, has been struggling to be able to solve some of these questions. Um, but I haven't tried this exact one on it before, so let's, let's see how it does. Um, it has at least written a JavaScript program. Uh, it has a lot of thoughts about uh, <laughs> it wants to tell me all of the fields on all these items, uh, which is really not necessary here. Um, the prompt does encourage it to be uh, somewhat thoughtful, but uh, at this point it's basically driven itself into a loop where once it started printing information, um, it's very excited to continue printing all the information available. So I'm going to say that's a fail uh, for Mixtral 22B, uh, but it's again fun to be able to compare these kinds of capabilities uh, and relative advantages and disadvantages. So I will wrap up there, but I've got uh, a lot more thoughts and explorations to do on this data set, so please do stay tuned.